Um, Dan, you got your camera? You good? Thank you. Okay. Okay, this is, yeah. Can I go? Yay. <laughs> Hi there. How you doing? Uh, familiar faces. Uh, three days in a row. You guys are amazing. I think this is awesome. Um, new faces, welcome. Uh, hope you enjoy it and hope that you'll be here tomorrow as well. Uh, but for today, this morning's session, we have uh, Dave Pierce and Pascal over here from Pascal and Pierce. Okay, I'm sure you know more about them than I do. Um, <laughs> Dave uh, was, was one of my students, um, also a school friend as well, so it's nice to have you back in a different capacity. Uh, Pascal over here, unfortunately, attended college at a uh, competition. <laughs> <laughs> um, but together they formed probably one of the most iconic um, electronic duos in the country. Um, incredible energy on stage. I've been privileged to play alongside them a number of times um, and, and also run stages that they've, they've played on as well. We've had them in our studio once or twice um, before back at Red Bull. Um, and so what we thought we'd do today is have a chat with them uh, regarding the launching of their label, um, what it's been like as an artist in lockdown, how they've kept themselves busy, how they've reimagined it, and of course the usual conversations around how do they produce music, what's their creative process, and we're all gearheads, most of us, so yes, what gear are they are using and things like that. So without further ado, Guys, welcome. Sure, thank you so much for the kind words. Okay, nice day. Thank you very much. Um, I, was, I was trying to find other stuff, but we'll get there. It's all good. Um, <laughs> yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess, do you want to start off with a, a little bit of history? I suppose um, how you met. Cool. Maybe how Pascal and Pierce started. Um, sure. And yeah, let's, let's take it from there. Yeah, I'm um, look, um, again, it's a privilege to be here and honored to chat to everyone. Um, Dave and I met. 2007 and we pretty much uh, were introduced to uh, through mutual friends. I was DJing at the time in Cape Town. I started DJing when I was about 13. Started throwing um, underground house parties and private events and all that kind of stuff and took a year overseas when I finished um, my schooling and then I started studying business management um, and during that course I met uh, Dave's mates from Joburg and they're like you have to meet this producer and actually got one of his CDs um, one of his like self-produced tracks and I was like sure this is fire and uh, he was at a club I was playing at I was like I have to play this track for this guy to see what he thinks and banger and then the next day we pretty much said let's hook it up in the studio started writing and haven't stopped then it's always been about the love it's about the happiness what it brings out um, you know I won't take away what Dave's done and let him you know explain what he's been up to in that sense now. Yeah, yeah, watch me up to. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no better time Sorry, than the present. I, I'm sure you guys can tell I'm not the chatty one in Majura. Um, what, what do you mean? What have I been up to in the present? Yeah, just no, carry on going for a bit. I'll jump in. <laughs> <laughs> no, just in the sense of like, you know, obviously Dave studied um, audio engineering and like... Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. When we met, I was studying here at Cape Audio. In that, in that sense, it was just really cool to know that um, uh, there was someone who could teach me how to produce music. You know, I could teach him how to DJ. And um, the stuff that I'd learned in, you know, throwing things together and meeting people, and um, it has just been a, a really cool process in um, learning everything that he's been able to sort of pick up on the way, and likewise in that same sense too. And it was pretty cool because obviously the first couple of years were super passionate in the sense of trying to just get as much music out as possible, and that you know that passion hasn't really um, stopped. It's actually got more uh, in depth and more um, sort of deeper. But the energy back then was just all about releasing content and making sure that we could just get out there and we were doing bootlegs and remixes of everything. Um, and it got to about 2009 when we did a Super Mario remix called Disco Biscuit. And um, sure, it just did really well overseas. And um, it was just that sort of signaling point where we decided to really take it on as a career. Because um, I was um, at the point of my, my studies where it was either taking business as a serious course of uh, education or you know, becoming a musician. So uh, the risk was um, epic and it definitely paid off. And it had to do with a lot uh, with um, time management, uh, making sure that your goals are orientated um, and believing in what you've got to do, 
you know, our process has always been about creating happiness. You know, if we are happy with what we produce and we are genuinely, you know, feeling what we can do and we can bring that to others, then we know that we've done a good job. Um, most people don't actually ask the question why they're doing what they're doing. And uh, recently it's just been more profound because, you know, we've been given such a great opportunity to have a showcase of what we can do. So if we can spread a good message and think about more than just music and what music can bring, um, then we can really tick off all the boxes. But um, mm. it's been, it's been a, a real humbling um, process too, because obviously, you know, getting signed to your first major label, or I suppose back then it was an independent uh, record label. They were the biggest at the time in the country. Um, we did a, quite a big um, a remix for a well-known duo called Lockenville, and they just popped off. Um, they just pretty much, like, just, yeah, they just pretty much exploded. And um, we were, I don't know if you guys know Ryan Murgatroyd yeah. uh, at all. He's a famous electronic producer. Oh, oh. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here as well, and also Craig Crazy. No, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Craig, for those of you that don't know Ryan as an artist independently, uh, you will know Crazy Wipe Away, and that's Costa and Ryan. Oh, and, yeah. so, and then also, yeah, Soul Candy was involved, and he also uh, brought in one of the most successful um, uh, programs for learning how to, to write uh, music and, and for uh, playing yes. keyboard. He actually has this, this amazing program which makes things really, really, well, mm. when I say program, it's a, a method that makes it really, really easy. True that. Um, yeah, it's actually, I need to get him back here. He's also like, no, inc incredible person. Done. He's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, no, no, all good. We were, um, we were lucky enough to actually be surrounded by these, um, these great people. And um, Ryan was running this, this uh, little studio of his uh, above a club. And we were there during the day, as per usual, just, you know, socializing and checking things out and listening to beats. And I went down to downstairs to the club because we were running a, an event there. Um, on a Thursday night and they were th forming a music video and it was Larkinville and they were like, I was like, I've heard this name. So I just decided as we were leaving, we saw them on the road. I was like, Dave, just go tune that bright. Let's do a remix for them and see what happens, you know? And it was super funny though. Yeah. But you said the non-chatty one to go and like... No, 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 but it didn't. <laughs> like, like, there's no way that would have worked. There's no way that would have gone down. So Pusky would have gone up. But it was super funny though, because I remember I was like, go Pusky, go ask him, ask him, ask him. And he went to the car and I think Drew thought he was getting robbed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Pusky's face just popped up. And like, <laughs> noticeably shat himself in the car. But yeah, he said cool and he put us in contact with his record label. And yeah, a couple of months later we were signed with him. Yeah, cool. it's just, just and, and you know what, guys, also in that situation, it's about listening to your instinctual gut and doing what you think is right for that moment, you know, obviously ethically in mind. Um, it's just one of those things where I'm so grateful for that situation because mm -hmm. it really did open up many doors for us because it gave us that connection with our first independent label and um, it just gave us a new direction of what we needed to do. Um, it did definitely change our style and production because uh, I remember like we had this... Uh, this whole process where we decided we we're going to make like 20 odd tracks, it was 23, a very like, particular number for us uh, <laughs> at the time and still is. Um, and what happened was uh, we had submitted literally 23 tracks to this new independent label and they were like, Bill, nah, it's not going to happen. Um, change everything, it has to be radio <laughs> friendly, it has to be this whole dynamic. And we were, you know, super focused on releasing this high intention, like mad electronic music that was the at the time, exactly, <laughs> yeah, like electronic, it was progressive, but unfortunately it didn't match what the mold needed to be. Um, so we scrapped everything and went back and started writing radio music and more interpretable music where it's just more uh, accessible and it definitely taught us a lot about how brands are created and how musicians can actually survive. It's unfortunate that um, the underground scene in South Africa, well, I like to you know, label it like that because it, you know, um, DJs in that scene don't necessarily make a lot of money and then they make a lot of headway in the progression where they can you know, become a um, you know, big name like Solomon, as an example, where you're playing in your 40s and you can still earn a really good living. Um, there are a lot of 40-year-old DJs in the techno sense that are banging in, in South Africa that aren't Solomon uh, that are just as good but they haven't created brands that are in, in the essence of what South Africa needs. So for us, I'm very grateful for that, that learning curve because it gave us that versatility, which is very important in production. Um, and especially in music, if you want to become a musician, you can't isolate yourself and box yourself in a way where you're only making one genre. 
because if you only focus on one thing, you're only appealing to one group of people, and we're all humans. We all want to make people happy, and that's what music brings. There's this uh, happiness that gives us a out of space and out of time feeling. So, you know, um, writing radio music uh, was a very cool journey. We've collaborated with every per every person, I think, in SA and on the Sun, which has been magnificent. And um, yeah, like, uh, what can I tell you? The remixes that we did in the beginning were just life-changing. We did stuff for Snoop Dogg, we did stuff for, um, I'm trying to think who's another big one, Above and Beyond was huge, Roger Sanchez. Um, Martin and, Solvig. Yeah, Martin that's, Solvig. That's uh, so it was really cool. Um, and then from there we just decided to uh, go, full, go full tilt. Eh? We did our own shows, we did our own documentaries online, we did as much content as possible. We really did focus on making uh, as many people as happy as possible. And that in the music game is very difficult. Um, we've got a golden rule of 80-20. So if we leave the party where 80% of the people were genuinely happy, genuinely enjoying what they did, obviously, you know, 90% of the people aren't really there for the music nowadays. They either want to come right, get loose, be associated with something, you know, look what, look what I'm wearing, look what I'm doing. Um, but the music is the spice nowadays. So when we leave after an event and we can honestly say to ourselves that people had a good time, then it's a good thing, you know? And it's also about before the show, you know, that's the most important part, uh, before and after, um, because you're gonna meet fans, you're gonna meet people that are interested in you, that are um, inspired or just wanna learn something about you. And if you give them that five minutes or that five seconds of just being patient or being sober or being in, in the moment with them, Mm. They can really learn a lot and, you know, they can do something great and that's what we need. We need good actions in the world, I think, right now. Um, and if you can have that sort of scope where, for us, we've never looked at the fame perspective. It's not really about us, but we get a lot of attention. Yeah. So, um, it's difficult to, to kind of gauge what we really want out of life and out of that. But the biggest thing is um, making sure that we don't look past that sense of humbleness. Yeah. Because if you... If you remain um, appreciative to what people have got, it's all about we all just want to have a good time. Yeah. You know? and well, it's if music. It's it not totally supposed to be serious. It's supposed to be fun. We're 100%. supposed to be having a good time. And yeah. I mean, if you're not enjoying it, it's not going to translate in what you're writing, and you're not going to enjoy playing it. And let's be honest, we all want to be out playing our own music and having a blast. So, uh, and it's a very interesting thing. Sorry, I, I just harping back on, on what you've just mentioned where you said, you know, being present in the moment and making yourself available for, um, for, for fans and for people. I mean, that's what I used to love about clubs like Assembly. You all had to come in the same entrance, you know what I mean? And, and you, you had to walk through the mm. venue before we could go upstairs where we'd like store our stuff or whatever. And, and everyone, you'd, you'd, you'd always be stopped or someone would always ask questions. And that was, the that was the beautiful thing is like you would always, well, I, mean, well, I think like Ivan, uh, Bruno, uh, even like Mark Niska one, all of it, everyone, like, no matter who you were, like everyone was so approachable and so mm -hmm. you could interact, you could talk, people could give you demos, I mean, whether you listen to it or not, but everyone <laughs> would always, I know, right? Uh, but everyone would always, it was always so friendly and it's, a, it's kind of a big difference that I've always found in the South African electronic scene, mm -hmm. I mean, all genres, um, compared to overseas where, where it's, it's kind of like you're isolated on a pedestal and you don't really interact. Whereas the South African DJs are so happy and, and producers are so happy to talk to people yeah. that we always seem to be available, even on social media. I mean, there's this new thing going around at the moment, if you've seen it. Tag your favorite like, artist yeah, yeah. to see and if they reply. It's so amazing <laughs> because, you know, yeah, Oaks are tagging big bands and stuff. And strangely enough, they're actually replying, which is awesome. But it's been so cool to see, like, I think you guys were tagged in a couple of them, Dean Fuel, um, you know. I saw, even I saw like Watson these, yesterday. Sorry? I saw Carl Watson yesterday. Yeah, Carl, well, I mean, yeah, Carl. And he responded. Carl pretty good at oh, <laughs> he's, he's a good guy. Yeah. Uh, Ian. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I think that was, that was always a, a, very, a, very, a very nice thing. Um, but I have to ask, so with all the happiness and the energy, the 80-20 rule, the playing, I mean, you guys were pretty much gigging all the time, traveling and everything. Um, how, how have you, well firstly, how have you approached what we've been through over the last sort of 20 odd months? Um, and how has that like maybe influenced the way you're producing music or has it changed your creative th thought process? Um, you know, I mean, obviously you guys are still happy, but you know, you're not able to test the waters, you know, you know yes, you can put things on radio, but you know, how's it, how, how's it, how have you adapted basically? Yeah, look. It's, it's been a journey, and I think um, 
big ups to every musician that's been obviously before COVID that was established that's got through this um, because it's been an epic sort of learning curve for most. Fortunately enough, Dave and I have always been um, productive. You know, we've always made sure that we're always busy. Um, at that point of uh, sort of our careers, we were signed to a major label, um, Universal Records, for those that wanted like to know. And we decided that it was time for us to release more content. Um, and they just went on the same sort of page where we were wanting to just establish ourselves more with our releases and our flow. Obviously signed, being signed to a major label, they've got a different outlook and picture and what they want you to be. Um, when you released, I think it was four songs in three years, mm -hmm. which for us is just not acceptable. Um, and we had an opportunity now through you know, this pandemic to start our own label and all of a sudden start releasing music on a regular basis. So from that perspective it was great because all of a sudden we were more hands-on on our future and making sure that we could just be more uh, productive that way. Uh, from a frustration point of view, obviously it's not, not nice not to not play to anyone, but again, it was also quite nice just to sit back for once in the, for in the beginning part, obviously because- The first three weeks. Yeah, it's like holiday. So you, <laughs> it was yeah, amazing. So, so like, sorry to interrupt, but I mean, I know you, you guys touring, I mean, it, it's it's ridiculous. Everyone thinks it's glamorous, but it's it's actually pretty stressful. It's pretty draining. It is, man. Yeah. Pretty draining. I mean, yeah. everything's for our family, you know. So. Yeah. No, I mean, like that 4:30 wake up call, so you can be at the airport for the red eye flight and not. So know. we used to we used to do 5 p.m. flights on Sundays. Yeah. Because like the tequila didn't agree with the. Yeah. the I'm, I'm there, I, I, dude. Don't, you yeah. don't have to tell me the Red Bull thing was yeah. always a disaster. <laughs> but now, like, there are kids, and you know, things have changed. And so yeah, 4 th 4:30 flights. Yeah. Is the one. No, yeah. definitely. Totally. And no. I, Yep. Oh, sorry, so just, um, but then, so you actually, you took a complete break and actually let yourselves reset and, and sort of chill? Or? Well, look, it's day by day, I think, in this pandemic. You know, we were obviously um, making sure that we were all cool and what our day-to-day -day obligations are. So always giving ourselves a to-do list, no matter how mundane it is, you know, making sure there's something to be done. Good. And that you're not, like, you know, contemplating things. And through that, um, you know, obviously, in the last like 15 years of traveling this country, I've, we've made a really cool network of people. Yeah. And I think that's also a really important thing to establish everyone is to really realize how important your network is because that's what's gonna build a better society, A, eh? and also a better infrastructure for yourself to adapt. Um, you know, um, we've, we've got personal things on the side too. Um, and obviously through this pandemic has kind of allowed us to expand on that. Um, so as a, as a musician, as an entrepreneur rather, it's, it's difficult with you know, allowing ourselves to let go a little bit of the music. Yes. But again, in, in um, logistical hindsight, it's given us so much more capability. Okay. Because I think in today's world, where um, firstly there's no government support from a musical perspective, from a financial perspective, um, there could be a lot more um, development and a lot more alignment towards creating musicians in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So we've been taking the risk full on you know, trying to entertain people. Yes. You know, there's been no infrastructure help whatsoever. And I think in, in hindsight, it's been brave for most of us to do that. Um, so educating yourself, allowing yourself to be adaptable, allowing yourself to have really great time management and you can achieve a lot. Um, and especially taking care of the ones around you. Yeah. If you're only happy and the ones around you aren't happy, it's not a great life. So, you know, focus on on that bigger picture too, which has been um, for us a really cool motto to live by, because I think uh, if you can have a good, you know, positive um, or at least progressive outlook on life, you've got a good chance for everyone it's around positivity, you. So yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it's difficult to kind of sit back and you know, want and want and want and want, but you've really got to put yourself out there okay. and start connecting yourself with people. So if you know someone that's in a similar industry to another person that you know, connect them up, even if there's. You know, um, even if there's no business, at least they know each other. Um, the idea is to connect people so future generations are helped out, and well, that's where it's at. Paying forward, like oh, of course, yeah, 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 totally. Um, um, also, sorry, just a good yeah. point. Actually, you, you you touched something. I I, I had a mentor once, um, and and I, the one thing he used to say stuck with me my whole life. And you just touched on. He basically said, "Your network is your net worth." At the end of the of day, course, and I yes. promise you. 
Like, it doesn't matter, you know, being able to reach out to someone if you, you don't even know them, but you know uh, somebody, you know, like Rome Pibus, for example, runs uh, Makulu Film, and you've yes, got a guy yes. who wants to do a documentary, and you, can, you know them, you might as well connect them because of you're course. just going to grow it, and everyone will remember that, and it will help you 100%. when you need help as well. So, well, look, cool. and I appreciate that, because obviously it's, it's, a, it's a huge good message. I mean, um, Dave and I um, have started writing music for uh, advertising companies and um, getting onto that sort of yeah. uh, sync and sort of score perspective has been really cool and uh, being a bit more adaptable in the music industry because obviously, you know, you can become a musician to write music or you can become a musician to, you know, um, release your own merchandise or whatever the case may be. But if you can have a little, um, at least try to do everything what music industry can offer, at least you set yourself, I've tried. You know, I've given it a full go. I didn't like hold back because there's nothing worse than saying what if. What if, yeah. You know, what mm -hmm. if I, I, I tried and it was a successful uh, industry or uh, something like that. Because the thing is what worries you most, as they say, masters you. So, you know, don't let your worries control you, man. Just go out there and, and do, do a do good it. thing and, and um, you know, be um, obviously uh, soft and kind on yourself because the more ambitious you are, the more intense you're going to be on yourself. So. The idea is just to go slowly, day by day. I mean, Dave and I have got a good saying, slow and steady. Yeah. It wins the race, man. It, it literally, in this, in, this, in this day and age, there's nothing worse than having something so good go so quickly, yeah. you know? So uh, I gotta ask you, yes. so what, you, what you're touching on here. Now, all of us, when we start writing music, we spend months uh, on that first tune, or the second, or the third, or the fifth, or the nine thousand, um, and we're very precious about our music. Uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of guts to let that go. And you find that now you guys have kind of let that go and let just the creativity go and not precious anymore? Or are you still a little bit protective? Are there the tunes? I think you'll always be a little bit protective. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a natural thing when you make music to... Hold on, it's kind of weird. It's my yeah. stapler, like, you know. Awesome. Yeah, I, I don't know if that'll ever truly go away, but it definitely gets easier. Yeah, a little yeah. less critical it definitely gets now. Easier, yeah. um, because, yeah. I mean, let's, see, let's, let's be honest, most of us in music or most of us that are into production or, or want to get into this industry have some way, shape or form of either ADHD or OCD or a combination of both. <laughs> and and so, so it's this weird thing where you want to present this beautiful package to the world, but it's never perfect. Yeah. And it's also like, is it good enough? And, and so, so how do you balance that actually? I mean, so, do you? Yeah, look, I, I think it helps yeah. a lot being in a duo because yeah. we've always got each other's opinion. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we've always got each other to be that first line of like, is this crap, is this good? <laughs> Yes, and like we're, we're very honest with each other, yeah. Like, so like um, I think that's actually like a lot of the stress of you know just wondering is it good enough? Um, because you'll know pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, you. you this will. dude who's been doing it for fourteen years will tell you straight up. Yeah. Like that's pretty bad. Yeah, that baseline's terrible. Don't like, even think yeah, about it. Like, straight up. Yeah. And, and it's again, and it's cool. Yeah. It's 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 a great dynamic in the duo, I think. And like without that element, I think like my person, like you touch on the OCD and yeah. the uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I would struggle with that immensely, I think. So I think it's great in terms of that dynamic with the duo. Just there's the constant support and just the balance of, you know what I mean? Because you can get stuck into a late night studio session and you can think you're like the great Khalil and this is like the best song <laughs> so that's true. ever been made. And the next day, maybe with fresh ears or maybe with another set of ears. You it's just like, kind, of, you kind of think, why did I spend six extra hours average. when I could have been sleeping? Yeah, you know? totally. <laughs> so, yeah. so that helps a lot. So then, I guess, the next logical question would be, can you take us through a typical day in the life of Pascal and Pierce? How do you approach the studio? What do you do? So recently with the pandemic, it's obviously been a bit different. Previous to the pandemic, it's quite funny because like, so we've always lived not the closest to each other. And then for two <laughs> years, I moved to Joburg because yeah. I met my now wife and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Love. So we were, love love is important, love. Guys. Love okay. is very important. You've got to have love to have good music. It's all about love. <laughs> um, so that was a bit of an interesting one in terms of the workflow, but we got around it. And then we got back to Cape Town and you were living in the Dudno. Mm. And I was living in Mooney Point and then Pusky moved to Constantia and I was in Green Point. Then I moved to Constantia and we were like 600 meters apart. Yeah. And then pandemic. three weeks later, Cyril said no one could leave the house anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, and we hadn't actually like hit a studio session because I was still like unpacking. Yeah. And so we hadn't actually done a studio. We finally lived like walking distance and it was just a and disaster. Cyril said no. <laughs> but anyway, so things have changed a bit since the pandemic. We've always tried to, prior, as I say, treat studio time 
as much as a normal job as possible in the sense that maybe not nine to five, but we would do like 10 to four or 10 to five-ish. <laughs> yeah. um, but giving ourselves that like maybe one day a week, depending on how busy the shows were on the weekend, we would take a DJ's Monday and like full unagi. Yeah. <laughs> and then the rest of the week, we would try to treat it okay. as prop. Yeah, or else it's easy to just slip into, uh, you know what I mean? I mean, it is a real job. And yeah, like, straight and up. I'd so I'd for us, it was always, yeah, putting in the professionalism and it's, again, another great aspect of being in a duo is you've always got that person pushing you, whereas I find, like, my personality a lot. <laughs> like, if I was left to my own devices, I'd be, like, playing a lot of FIFA and stuff. And still making lots of music. Yeah, I'm still making lots of music, but at weird times. I'd play FIFA and then later I'd be like, oh, idea, and then it's just not healthy. It's not good. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's great in the sense with the duo that we constantly push each other um, and you feel that you have a responsibility not only to yourself but to someone else to put in the work. You know what I mean? If I take a chill day and just play FIFA all day, yeah. I'm not kind of messing up my day, I'm messing up Pusky's day too. Yeah. So, so that's it's like a that, responsibility. Yeah, there, and that's yeah. always been like a really strong fire underneath you to you yeah. know, get up and go make music and stuff. Um, but back to how we tackle a studio session, I don't know, we don't really have a... a standardized way of going about things. It'll yeah. depend on the project we're working on. If we're working on a remix, we'll often start with a key, key. lead or a key vocal or something that makes the song the song. Yes. Mm. And then mm -hmm. like one of our favorite things to do is like especially take a vocal and then build a new chord progression around that. Okay. Cool. So like, um, yeah, because yeah, we've always, always been like quite musical in the sense of our productions, like music theory and um, yeah, this, uh, I, like I get a kick out of mm a challenge in music, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like taking something and recreating it as your own, yeah, anyways. Well, no, no, um, it makes perfect sense. But yeah, so if we're working on a remix, we'll start with the, the key elements and try work around that. If we're starting with a fresh idea, it could be anything, man. We could come up with a cool beat and be like, let's expand on this. We could come up with a really cool bass line and expand on that. We could mm -hmm. take a vocal and chop it up and then expand on that. It's, yeah. It's not really a standardized way we go about things. And I think that yeah. keeps it fresh and it keeps it exciting. And yeah. yeah. Well, and also the samples that we got on, on that week or yeah. whatever the VST, the new plugin, you know, learning that way, learning that treat, whatever it yeah. is, you know, uh, referencing also, no, you know, obviously. listening to a lot of new music is so important. But if, okay, let's take the pandemic out, out of it. Let's yeah. just talk about like if it was just normal. Do you guys, like, I mean, do you guys, when, you, when you're working, do you like to work together or is it a case where sometimes you yeah. come up with an idea and you send it off, you know, even say 600 meters up the road, but you just, you know, email it off and, mm. and then work on it backwards or do you... We've been having to do that because of the pandemic, but yeah. first prize is always together. together. That's okay, so it is, it always, is definitely... Yeah. Because it's, it's quicker yeah. and also like Much you can quicker. feel it easier, you know what I mean? Yeah, and so it's also right then and there, so it's yeah. like, hey, do you like this? No, this is bad, yeah. let's change it. As all. opposed to yeah. put a brief master notes? on, yeah. export, yeah. send it. No, that's cuck. Like, yeah. Yeah. You're like, okay, <laughs> let's yeah. try that again. <laughs> And Stop being my a and guy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely together in studio is the way 100%. forward, 100%. It's just because yeah. you get into the, the flow and, you know, it's yeah, two heads are always better than one. Yeah. Um, and ideas that, you know, I wouldn't have by myself or Pasky wouldn't have by himself mm. can be formed just by, you know what I mean? Because you always get, you get stuck on things in studio. Like you'll, oh, yeah. you, you, hit a, you hit a bit of a wall and it's just not, and then someone will make a stupid joke and then it's <laughs> ha ha ha, and then it just clicks, you yeah. know? It's, so, it's, yeah. You be out of the moment briefly to get back into it and sitting by yourself in a dark room. <laughs> it don't, that doesn't help, yeah. It's not good for the soul. Uh, no I, comment. <laughs> yeah. Look, I mean, and both of us are um, producers in that sense where we just try to be as like productive yeah. with, our, with our music. You, um, and do you, would you, I mean, like, are you guys ruthless? Um, and I, I know I've become ruthless in the last sort of like 10 years, like whereas I'd work a song and work a song and work a song thinking it's going to break, if you know what I mean. Eventually, like, just actually now, I've got to this point where I'm like, and you can go in the B folder, you know, and it just yeah. shelve it, or... I mean, our favorite thing to do is to do a song 90%, because mm -hmm. we can get 90% done really quickly. Yeah. Like, a day's worth of work can be 90% of a song, or, you know, a couple hours in the evening, or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And then hit that, then it goes into the pile. Okay. And then every now and then we sit and we go through the pile, and especially like when Pusky was saying, when we were with Universal, 
for how many years were we there for? Four years. Four yeah, years, yeah. and they yeah. released four songs. It was spectacular. So the amount of yeah. songs we made in that time <laughs> that weren't released. <laughs> just so, laughing at it. Yeah, I know it was. It's universal, dude. I mean, actually, the fact you got four songs out is quite impressive, yeah, actually. Yeah, it was spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to go back and revisit yeah. that pile from time to time, like our last two singles, we actually started, when did Belong? Coconut, Coconuts. Yeah, 2016. 2016, and it was released this year. Okay. So, I mean, it's obviously the final result is quite different, but yeah. we had the... Yeah, we, but for sure, but the... The, the, the structure. The structure was there, the initial the idea was there, and you just yeah. got to revisit it, because... Mm. It, and add vocals. Yeah, and, and vocals, and, and also on top of it, look, you know, things aren't always written at the right time, if, mm. if you know what I mean. Like, so, sonically, or um, maybe, you, you know, sometimes, uh, it's a very weird thing, it's like almost like a deja vu thing in the studio, we're like, you come up with an idea and then you, you, you play with that idea and you're kind of like, well, it's really cool, but it's not right, if that makes sense. Leave it for a couple of years and all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's, it's fitting into the, the, the space that it's supposed to be. Of course. So that, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a yeah, save, I mean, your se save, save your sessions, basically. 100%, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She's like, what's that, auto save 10 minutes or something? Jesus, yeah. Um, look, I, I think for us, it's about making sure we've got enough content for um, the next couple of months uh, in the foreseeable future. So we've got you know, our next two or three radio singles planned, as oh, an cool. example. And then we've also got music that's more club and festival orientated, that's more, so, say, dirty, uh, or more housey or more funky, whatever the case may be. So it's having that content availability to not write music off in that way. Um, but also, you know, getting back to Universal, you know, we are grateful for what they did yeah. establish for us. I mean, they've, mm -hmm. they gave us our first double platinum record um, in the sense of capability, so we don't under undermine uh, a major label. Um, we just see the value in what independence has brought us in the sense of mm. constantly bringing out new music and not having to be restricted by anything um, in the essence of just what music is about, you know, which is really cool. So I guess we may as well broach the subject then. Yeah. What's it like running a label? <laughs> That's been fantastic. I mean, a lot of work. It's, yeah, yeah it is. It's a lot of work. Good so, Lord. So talk, talk, talk us through that, actually. How did you go about the whole process? We spoke Quite about while, this for yeah. years. We've been chatting about this for years and years and years and years and years. And then it was a combination of the pandemic. Suddenly we had a lot of time on our hands. Um, we were trying to get out of our contract with Universal, which took quite a bit of time. But in the end, it was all very amicable, amicable and yeah. smooth. And the Good one piece, thing yeah. that surprised us about that is this pretty much the day we signed the termination contract, all of our stuff disappeared off um, streaming services, which wasn't something we 100% planned for. <laughs> and it <laughs> took quite a long time to get that back up. That's so. a bit mean. Ah, bro, <laughs> you know what, to be fair, it's one of those things, but I mean, we are, um, again, we don't hold grudges to anyone. Again, we're appreciative to what they offered us. Right. And it was just being real in the situation about, you know, um, when you're such a big entity, you know, you can only manage um, so many people correctly, and mm -hmm. when you're signing everyone, it's very difficult to have that perspective. Like, lost in the ether, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like with our label, we're not running it as an artist management perspective. We have signed artists from a licensing perspective. We, we've given them a favorable uh, percentage, better than most majors are offering right now, and it's just about distribution. We've got a really cool t uh, team in the UK that are handling a lot of our uh, PR and our distribution. We've got another cool team in uh, Sweden and another item KZN, and yeah, they're making some really cool headways for us. Um, you know, obviously getting plugged in. Overseas radio would be the goal. You know, yeah. BBC radio is where we're aiming for, in the essence of getting on that sort of, shows, so um, yeah, charting there would be a, a really big achievement in that sense. Uh, obviously getting back onto the road, um, you know, playing to peeps overseas would be really cool. Yeah. But again, it's about, you know, being patient and not being, uh, you know, too demanding on what what's out there, you know, already there's so much great music out there. Um, yeah. There's so many amazing things happening out there. So just being persistent, I think, is also really good. Now you, uh, I mean, obviously you have a unique sound. We, we know this, um, but the label, is it, how can I put this? So say, for example, you got approached by an artist that is not exactly in your genre. But I say genre, I'm not saying like a dubstep artist approaches you and asks Bring to release. It. Oh really? Yeah, yeah of course. Cool. I mean, I've, I've got a flash. I'll, I'll get back. To that. <laughs> uh, so, so you, but sonically wise, I mean, as long as you are digging the production, yeah. as long as you, it feels up to a certain quality yeah. level. I mean, yes. you guys are pretty cool. Like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna like say, "Oh, I don't think so," nah. because you never know. I mean, yeah. bro, to be honest, like, we, we're not, we're not gonna be that kind of, you know, like 
brand orientated thing. If you've got good beats and you want us to release it for you, we can do it for you. We're not going to be like, we're going to change your lives by, you know, doing huge social media posts no, and no, all course. that kind of stuff because that's, in essence, is, you know, I kind of feel like an artist agreement. Do you know what I mean? And not even majors offer that sort of intensity behind every single artist. So I think, um, again, about asking yourself why you're doing this. You know, what are you trying to achieve? What is the bigger question, you know? And really get on that. And I think allowing yourself to release your own content more frequently will allow people to establish who you are. And if your music's good, people recognize it. Yeah. That's it, you know? But I think one thing that was really cool for us was just after we launched the label, we got a mail on socials from some guy. Yeah. And he had done a remix of an old song that came out in 2013. And he tried to contact the label at the time and they didn't even get back to him. Then a couple of years later, he tried to contact the label again and they turned him down. Um, we didn't even know about this. Like this hadn't even touched our door. Oh, we you remixed know. your yeah. track? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the label had just blocked him, blocked him without us even knowing. And then pretty much as soon as we launched our label and the track came out, he contacted us. And we were like, yeah, man, yeah, why not? Like, it. Let's, <laughs> let's do it. So it was cool to give him that opportunity That's after so, so many years. We were like, thanks so much for the persistence. Yeah, you know dude, what I mean? Exactly. Like, yeah, very great. Eight years later, you're still trying on this remix. We're like, cool, <laughs> thank you very much. Let's make it happen. That's I, th I, th I think, like, also, like, Pasquier and I have always been very uh, diverse in our musical tastes. Like, we'll listen to a lot of weird stuff combined, like, weird stuff. So that helps a lot with the production and then, like, variety and changing that. Mm. But I think also being locked in with Universal for so long and having such a, you know, 180 perspective on it. Not let's release lots of cool stuff, let's release almost nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think once we were out of that, we were like, let's just, just release it all. Just <laughs> like, put it all there. Yeah. Just stick a sticker on it and release it. Like, <laughs> obviously within reason. But yeah, we're super open to just getting beats out there because in this, what's this that? 60,000 songs released a day or something yeah. like that? Something like that. I mean, it's it's it's, it's definitely on there. I mean, there's really close to 90 million songs available. So, yeah. when you look at the math, you know, there's so much music that you're going to miss in life, mm. and there's just that appreciation for listening to good music. You know, we are bred to consume nowadays, we're not bred to appreciate. Oh yes. Flip that, and then you've got way better culture in yeah. how we do things. So. Yeah. No, but, it's, uh, I, yeah. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you say that the, the being signed with a major yes. was an important stepping stone? Of course, 100%. So would you recommend for them to persevere that or to go straight? So look at your contract. Firstly, studying is important. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. A place like this is, a, is literally a homage. And again, congratulations and well done to everyone here because we need places and institutions like this to allow people to become successful musicians. Okay. Mm. Yeah, to yeah, that level. Of course, yeah. <laughs> we can chat about yeah. that, totally, yeah. yeah. Mm. But again, you know, um, getting back to the major question, you know, I, I would look at your contract, look at what your offerings are, give the major label deadlines, because if they don't meet those deadlines, then you can see what your next five years is going to be like, uh, or four years. And, you know, labels are signing people up to like 10 years now. Mm. So you, in the next 10 years, you if you've got to make sure your interests are, are there, you know, I mean, at least 50-50, you know, that's what good business is for us, is like making sure that if you've had a good show, if the promoter was happy, the bar was happy, everyone, the staff, we treated them well, that's when we know we've done a really good show, you know, like, versus going in, demanding things, it, we've, we see it all the time. Let's get off. Exactly. <laughs> Stuff like that, it's just like we, everyone is the same on this place, and the more we can communicate with each other, the more great things can happen. And by putting up these hurdles, it's just, yeah, it's very, very difficult. So from a contractual perspective, make sure that if you don't understand what you're reading, a lawyer gets involved because that 5,000 or 3,000 rand fee that is going to um, cost for their legal sort of knowledge well, is going to be... Of course, know. yes, yeah, they are. They are. I know SDBB, um, they've got a new branch uh, focusing on that, obviously EWS. Uh, Dean's dad, I think. Yeah, yeah Dean, um, Dean. Dean Fuller, Michael yeah, Fuller's, Phil, Michael yeah, Fuller's. Amazing, mm -hmm. probably yeah. one of the best in the yeah. business. Hundred percent, yeah. Contractual knowledge is uber important, um, especially on deliverance. Um, and that's definitely one of the things we've learned the most in our career, I'd say. Yeah. 
looking at contract. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looked at a lot. Gotten yeah. pretty good at it now. It, but, um, it, yeah. Totally. Doesn't hurt that Pusky's wife's a lawyer either. Yes. Good luck, dude. Again, getting back to the network, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's that s it's sentiment of um, most of us sign on to a huge thing because it's this huge promise and this huge belief that your life is going to change. The idea is that you've got to keep doing things for yourself, making sure that you can still contribute. Don't rely on others to do things. If they've got a set goal and a set uh, sort of uh, duty to do, they have to do that. If they don't do it, move on and then, you know, no love lost, it's just about learning, it's essentially, yeah. I mean, um, the difference between an independent label and a major label, I would say that an independent label, because they are less artist signed, there's more management care. There's more understanding, there's more emphasizing it's on like communication, exactly, it's familiar. Whereas if you go to a major label, because it's so big, it's almost like extended, it's like speaking to your cousins. You don't really know what's going on because you don't speak to them every day, you know? So, um, in, in, in what? So that, 100%. So the, the, their biggest sort of attribute would be distribution and how they're distributed and how they're getting onto editorial playlists. And that's what we did find was with, um, with a major, it gave us that uh, all of a sudden opportunity to be showcased um, on this huge platform. Um, so it is worth that risk. So, I mean, the best way I could describe it right now from a personal perspective would be signing on as a license. Um, so don't sign on yourself as an artist. So if you, if you go to a major label, sign a license deal with them. And say we were on a license deal though. But we were more exclusive though. We couldn't. So, so yeah. we, were, we were on a license deal with Universal and when we managed to get out of it, it all worked. Yep. It took a while, but it worked. And then we've got friends who are on artist deals, that are 360 a little bit more artist exclusive, deals. Yeah. And now they're in a world of yeah. cuck now that they've left because now they retain ownership for life. And, yeah. and, 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 and. Totally. But again, it's, it's how they label the wording. Yeah. So, we were unfortunate enough to be in a situation from an exclusivity perspective, we couldn't collaborate or um, release music on the fly like a, a normal licensed individual person would be allowed to do. Um, obviously those are the extremes that you have to learn and, and work through and I think that is, um, we're grateful for that because we've now mm -hmm. understood you know, who the best distributors are or at least the top five are in the world, um, how they work and how they function. So it's, it's good to, to have these things and you know, in business, you've always got to, um, you've always got to learn, you've always got to progress, right? You've always got to build, and you, you can't do these things um, without, you know, some sort of uphill, you know? And, and I think it's great, you know, in essence, f fortunately enough, it didn't cost us a lot. It just cost us time, and obviously that is the most important thing, but from a perspective of learning, we learned a lot, and I'm very grateful for those moments. I mean, it's just, it's really cool. Um, so again, major labels, read your, read your contracts. Third. The residency with Fire Pen was that hooked up by the major? No, no, no. no. So we were very fortunate enough. Um, we had a good relationship with um, Roger, and uh, he's always supported our music. And um, yeah, since 2009, he's just always backed us, and you know we've had a good relationship. And um, we did it for five years, and then we took a year break, and then we just started off. I think it's like. Week 40 or something now? So you're back, you're back on again, eh? Yeah, every Friday night. Yeah, so, um, so it's really cool. Um, just showcasing electronic music every week's different style. Mm. Um, so really grateful for the opportunity um, in that sense. And obviously learning with the label, we've learned a lot about how radio works and like which are government owned and run and which are privately run and which radio stations you should be, you know, punting your music on because essentially that's where you're going to garnish a lot of money. You know, a, a private company is going to pay you a lot more than SABC, unfortunately, which is just the case. You know, um, so making sure you've got a good uh, plugger is what they they call nowadays. Um, so, but even that, um, building up good relationships with the the stations can happen from a personal perspective too. It's just about making sure you've got um, time to, you know, wait because essentially they do take a long time to get back to you because. They are being inundated with music every single day. So, um, yeah, gay network. Making yeah, sure you go through the due diligence. Yeah, yeah. Say that again? Getting airplay. Yeah, well, also, also getting airplay in the right way, you know. Yeah. And this was a part of the performance as well, getting a name there. But we found when we were starting off, as soon as the radio airplay kind of kicked off and we were on top 40 and whatnot, the gig floodgates, like, 
yeah. Yeah. Open. So yeah. It was a different important. ball it's game gonna, altogether. It's, it, yeah. it, works, it works in both ways. Yeah. Yes. Either they feed you, each like, other. Once you start getting booked and people like, and you're getting booked a lot because of X genre or whatever, and people then realize you're releasing music, all of a sudden they're requesting that. Whereas mm. if you're releasing music or you on on by airplay, yes. then all of a sudden yeah. you know, people obviously want to book you because they want the shows, they want to hear the songs, and that's a, it's a yeah. So it's a never-ending story, really. Hundred percent. So what we we found out in the beginning was um, it was so strange because we'd been producing like electronic music, and then when we started releasing radio music, electronic bookings went down. And we're like, but we have got more people that can attend your shows, but because we weren't now releasing, plugging what you did, yeah. And mm. it was just like, okay, it's like such a tough bullet to bite through because you're just like, why are we not playing the music we love? Yeah. In essence, you yeah. know, because now we're just having to play a brand, which is very frustrating because yeah. then you don't get to essentially um, do it. And then also it creates confusion with people too, because if you are writing and releasing radio music and you're also writing and releasing, you know, dirty electronic music yeah. and you go play a set and you're meeting the crowd, it's one of those situations where you've got, you know, do you play what people want to hear? Or do you, do you play what people essentially know you for? Yeah. So I think education for me has always been the best value and reading what the energy of the space brings. Every venue has a different energy. Every um, sort of night has a different sort of feeling. And um, the DJ before you and the DJ after you, yeah. there needs to be some sort of flow. Yeah. So when you're catering for people, like I find it quite frustrating when a DJ goes in and like plays the same set every single time you see them, or a similar show. Yeah, no, no, no. Because it's not really giving people their journey. You know, you are there to entertain them. You know, it's yeah. not about necessarily you. Yeah. So when you go on that level of um, uh, sort of what's it, intimacy with music, people don't see the value in it sometimes because they just want to hear something that they, they just want to hear that banger that or you're that known track, for. Or, yeah. Exactly. So yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Totally, yeah. Okay, before we carry on, sorry, I just want to pause this gentleman over here has been waiting to ask you a question. Oh, my bad. No, uh, how's it going? Hi, bro. Um, good, thanks, bro. Good, um, good. I had a question with regards to, you guys do a lot of remixes as yes. sampling. Yes. Um, I do remixes and sampling as so, well. Send us your stuff, we'd love to hear it, bro. Thank you, man. Yeah, <laughs> I've been having so much <laughs> problems with trying to re uh, get clearance for the song. Oh, uh, yeah. How do you guys go about it? So, in the beginning, we just bootlegged it. And that's how we got like around it in the sense of just putting it on SoundCloud. And that's how it was in, in that, that day. Uh, where you could kind of just get around it. Um, and I know they have started paying for remixes on, on SoundCloud from a financial perspective. So uh, if your bootleg does get a lot of you know, plays, you can get, get the royalties for it. But um, clearances are where major labels actually come into play because they've got such a good relationship with those distributors, those labels, those A&R peeps. They can say, right, if you want a Kanye you know, lyric, we know which label to speak to, you know, whether it be UMG or uh, Warner. Um, that's how they run it, in essence. So, um, yeah, getting those clearances, uh, there was a question just asked on how, um, how do you we deal with samples, our basically. samples. And it's been mostly through um, majors getting that sort of clearance, um, that sort of capability. They've definitely got the, the rights for it. We've actually got a song right now that we're doing a, uh, we've just done a, a, re, a remix for that. Um, the vocalist wants a royalty fee up front. So let's just say it's $1,000. They'll want that fee to use that, um, that vocal or that sample. So um, generally that, that can be arranged that way. I mean, uh, what, what vocals are, are you using out of interest? Um, I've only just recently discovered Letter of Bulu. So it's a 1970s disco. Like, oh, amazing. But cool, it's, dude. It's, it's like, to find out who owns the well, so, 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 so what year in 17? What, no, what, what year in 17? I think it's 73, I'm not too sure. That's so next year you'll be able yeah, to, yeah, in two years, years time. In 50 years, you're done. Yeah, in 50 yeah, years yeah. time. Yeah, next year you can release it free. I thought that was a word. No, no, no. That's, it's reality, it's bro. Not, it's uh, okay. Yeah. So just, yeah, just check what year it is released and then you can, you can yeah. release it. Just work 50 years. I mean, I'm not looking for the money, if I want to lose money, I'll go on and just find it. Totally. It does. So what I would do is um, get in touch with the uh, the label that's releasing the, or holds the rights for the song, 
and it'll always be on YouTube. Um, just check on the original mm -hmm. um, sort of, uh, what's it, the description. Or even on um, Spotify, if it's or, on Spotify. Or um, Discogs. Discogs, Discogs too. just type it in, put there's a number on the, on the vinyl, yeah. or just put in the artist's name and everything, the entire listing will come up. Everything's available. Yeah. Uh, who sampled? There's a website for those of you who don't yeah. know. It's called Who Sampled. Mm. You can literally plug something and you can see who's used it, where the rights lie, how you can get it. It's it's an incredible database. And the other thing, and please don't quote me on this, but I think I mean I've done I've done like three or four Dell remixes. I've done remixes for Timberland stuff without any permission. Put it up on SoundCloud, and it's still there 13 years later. So. Um, <laughs> it's got five plays. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, you, you can also risk it because what's the worst they can do? They hit you with a cease and desist letter and you, and you, you take it down from SoundCloud. Unless you're trying to uh, actually make huge money off it. Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. question. That's a, yeah, a whole other league. <laughs> yeah, no, mm. for sure. Mm. Um, Thank you very much. Guys. Oh, man. Pleasure, man. All good. Um, All the best to them. Before we launch into Q and A, I just want to—I want to I w I obviously ask the that 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 important question. So, the workflow. I mean, yeah. we've established you guys like to work together, which is obviously fantastic. Um, you know, obviously forgetting the pandemic. But like, I think what a lot of a lot of the youngsters, maybe the first years, guys that are, are new into to music production, and we've all been there. Um, it's a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you approach sessions now? Because I mean, are you templating a lot of stuff? Are you still experimenting with tons of new VSTs? Or have you kind of got your little toolbox? How, how are you guys streamlining your process? Basically? I'd say we've more, more got our little toolbox. Um, you know, we, we know what works for us now. Um, <clears throat> one thing, the 14 years of producing music together, it's, it's the speed has gotten a lot quicker. It used to take us quite long to get to a point where, you know, you have an idea in your head and then to get that down, it takes a while and by the time you get there, you've forgotten this idea in your head and then it's just a nightmare. It's a new song. Though. Yeah, exactly. Now it's a new song. Um, <laughs> exactly. But like, yeah, so speeds become a lot quicker and easier for us. We can get something down while it's still fresh and then build an ad on that. Um, templates, we fine-tuned the shit out of our templates. We've got different templates for different situations. If we're doing a mix down, if we're doing just a normal track, if we're doing an idea, if we're doing mixes like for five or whatever, we've got all our templates. And yeah, we've just really fine tuned what we need out of a session. So like we'll have to break our template down. I guess we've got yeah. drums at the top with like mm. four channels for kicks, four channels for claps, four channels for snares, six channels for hi-hats, six channels for percussions, four channels for cymbals, then they'll be subgrouped into them. Uh, we like to group claps into claps, snares into snares. Yeah. Then we like to group that again into claps and snares. Then that all goes into the drum bus. Then so below like that. Ultimate grouping. Yeah, yeah. You, you, grouping. You, you guys are as OCD as I am. I'm loving yeah. this carry on. <laughs> Nicely color coded, of course. Yeah, so yeah. You know Soft they're... pastels, <laughs> easy on the eye. Easy on the eye. Yeah, Very um, much so easy on the eye, exactly. <laughs> Then we got our FX, it's normally about 10 to 12 channels for FX. Then we got 12 to 14 channels for samples, mostly if we're doing remix stuff. Yeah. Um, work, yeah. Yeah. Below that, then we've got our MIDIs, we normally start with about 14 channels for MIDI. Vocals. Um, yeah. Vocal. Yeah. Vocal, the purple one, of course, <laughs> the purple <laughs> one. Um, yeah, vocals, then the MIDIs. Uh, we like to, in our template, have a removable kick track. Yeah. just so that we can get started with some side chain and just so it's there and then you chuck it and find something in key. Mm -hmm. We like to start with a Nexus preloaded just because I find the Nexus yeah, no, no. default patch is great for ideas because it's polyphonic. It's just a pretty much straight up sawtooth sound. Nice. You can yeah. filter it down and it sounds beautiful. You can filter it up and it sounds aggressive. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a great place I find to start with ideas. Like if you've got an idea for a melody in your head or a chord progression or whatever, Pretty much anything, you can lay it down mm. on that Nexus Sawtooth. Great. Yeah. And then from there, expand into other VSTs or whatever. Piano's um, not too bad either. Okay. The piano. On yeah, Nexus no, the piano is amazing. Yeah. God, the, what's cinematic piano? Mm. Tears. Oh, you've, got that whole, you've got that whole pack. Yeah, like the, tears. That thing is, yeah, that's serious. Yeah, uh, Nexus is great. Just easy to get to, as they were yeah. saying. But yeah, I find we've definitely refined our production style into a very much so in-the-box 
sort of style. So no hard, no, no hard resistance? No, nah, we've got MIDI controllers, which we don't often use. Um, USB, okay. Yeah, uh, I just find, because like when I started, when I came here, I was into like punk rock and stuff, and like micing up a band and a drum kit is a mission. It's a huge mission. So Don't I started, say that. No, but it really is. You learn that here. It's huge. It's not that bad. It's so difficult. Well, it's not difficult. It's just, it's just a mission, time man. Time consuming. So uh, time consuming. Time there we consuming, go. Time consuming. And so then I, you have to account for phase because I, those so, mics and 180 and yeah. No. So I started making hip hop just because then I didn't have to. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I got into hip hop because I didn't have to like <laughs> record a punk drum kit. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then I met this guy and he showed me that dance music was cool. <laughs> but um, so we've definitely refined our style to, to suit us, you know? Totally. Um, I think some of the toys that we have, we've got a MIDI guitar, which is pretty cool. It looks like a... Um, like a guitar. No, a oh. MIDI guitar. Oh, wow. It looks yeah. like a, what's that thing on the PlayStation? Urock, no, what's that? Oh, oh, like the, uh, the, the guitar, guitar hero thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, looks, it looks like a guitar hero guitar. It's even got the colors. I think you can plug it into a PlayStation yeah. and it works. Yeah, you but can. But it's like this a... Could, would no. you, it could do you, and in a live show, would you... Would uh, we you tried it, it for a bit, but there was a bit yeah. of latency issues, and it just it wasn't oh, vibing man, so much. that would be amazing. And, and also, cool. it was the early yeah. days. It the new DJ Invisible with his guitar. Yeah. But we, we, we brought it in from Germany. It was early days. It was like a pre-crowd fund, crowd fund sort yeah. of thing. Wow, okay. So I think we definitely got like the beta version. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a software update? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's cool. I mean, that's probably the most fun we play in terms of toys and stuff. Um, we've always had a good relationship with Pioneer, and they hooked us up with a whole bunch of stuff a couple of years ago, and that was super cool. What was that thing? Torias. Oh yeah, the yeah, geez, the that thing was fun, man. The squid and then and the that little ribbon synth. Oh, did you get did you get mm. those the little the units? Mm. Yeah, we had those mm. bridges as well at yeah. one stage. They're incredible. Fun, stuff. Man. It really was amazing. Fun, Created dude. a lot of beats on those. Yeah. Eh? yeah. Uh, actually, don't don't be fooled. Sorry for those of you that don't know, Pioneer is not just the manufacturers of some of the Dave most Smith. amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, DJ equipment, yeah. but they, no, so they've got that thing with Dave Smith now. Yeah. It's now so Dave Smith, as some of you might know, is uh, prolific with uh, synths and VSTs, etc. Um, and he's been involved in the algorithms and 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 the the production of, of some of these units, much mm -hmm. like what Ivan was showing those of you that were here yesterday with those new revamps of the Roland 808s and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, don't be fooled. Go check out their website. That stuff is yeah, yeah it's proper, it's proper, proper fun. Yeah. There's uh, what's it? Audio Pro Audio. Is Pro Audio. Yeah. yeah. Check them out. They're yeah. the ones who distribute Pioneer. If everyone wants to know them. Um, but again, like getting back to your mastering question about what the the sound is about and how it's. Uh, eventually comes out and you know analog gear is always going to give you that warm sound essentially mm. um, but yeah, yeah. we've got to the point where our pre-masters are really good in the essence of like we could be happy enough but we obviously never do that we obviously want someone else to master our music because it's again more ears they can pick up something that we no, missed never master your own music no for sure but some people yeah. feel confident it, it, in but it's amazing that. how um, something will just slip straight past yeah. you because yeah. you've been so exposed to it for so long sitting and staring at the same thing yeah and then like um a fresh it, set of ears it, takes one look it. i mean it, it literally you're sitting there it, it, mm. you, you guys are at least in a unique kind of situation where because there's two of you it, you know it, you can bounce back and you're continually pulling it apart but i mean most of us when we're working by ourselves we get way too close and mm. the easiest way to get away from it is to to just pay the money and like, you know, give it mm. to somebody you trust and let them do what they do best. For sure, yeah. for sure. Um, yeah. But you are mixing, You're, you do yeah. all yeah. your own Very much mixing so, yeah. as well. Yeah. So. That's definitely the biggest change since when we started, I would say. <laughs> it's funny, listening to like the earlier tracks now, it's just like. <laughs> what side chain? <laughs> what side chain? But it's epic because side chain, like if you think about it in the beginning, wasn't really something that people used in electronic music right in the beginning. I don't know why. <laughs> it just wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. And like, yeah. Um, well, like, except for like New York and disco. And true that. Because they were, they were side chaining the living down. I mean, New York compression basically. 95. Is the other, yeah. other term for it. So, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, cool. Um, I reckon let's open it up to some questions. Cool. I'm sure there are plenty. Sweet. Cool. Um, you have mentioned your diverse music taste. Yes. Give us a taste. <laughs> what is your favorite song or favorite discovery that you found this last month? And who do you think is the most exciting 
forward thinking act working right now, so ideally in Cape Town? Okay, so I was going to say international. I think this year, Danny Asadi making that like Persian trap music with the sitar. Yeah. For me personally, it was really cool because I, I enjoy the sitar sound and like what it kind of brings. And no one's really brought that kind of instrument to electronic music before. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, Tony definitely. <laughs> so like Danny, from my from my side, has been really cool to to kind of listen to uh, from an electronic perspective. Um, Obviously, from a uh, more dance perspective, I think um, Carl Watson has done some really cool things, man, like from a local perspective. Um, obviously, um, thinking on an international tip too, um, who have I recently just got into? Uh, I have to check my, my iTunes or Spotify account right now, but um, there are just so many cool artists that I'm really listening to. So from, again, Persian trap to um, like classical music. It's a Persian uh, trap. It is. It's, it's, it's labeled there. It's, it's a trap. I swear to God. But it, it's it's one of those things where um, being diverse in your in your listening capabilities is going to give you a better edge. So I listen a lot to the radio actually. So if I like a, a song, I'll keep it there. Otherwise, I'll just flick through it uh, without actually like putting a CD or USB in. I'll just literally journey listen to what's out there. Um, <coughs> And it's funny because like on social media, we're not big on social media, uh, like what we can do because I think it's mostly ego stuff, but um, I like to listen to a lot of music on social media. So I follow a lot of people, um, a lot of forums, and you just get introduced to new, new styles that way. Um, any bands of you enjoying at the moment or heaps that you've been well, Discovery to? wise. Yeah. I'm trying to think the most. Do you mind if I bring up my phone? There's a, cool. there's, a, there's a song called SOB by Nathaniel Ratcliffe and whatever his friends are called. That's super vibey. That's like weird. It sounds like a 1920s prison line when they all sing. You know, what's that movie? Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they do that. Slap you. Like, that's, that's some awesome, weird yeah. shit. But I heard that and I was just like, it's just vibey. This is the beat. It sounds gospely and people clapping on the offbeat and shit. Yeah. Happy yeah. music. Zach's yeah. been tweeting, obviously. He's doing some oh, cool, things. Yeah, um, Zach's doing cool things. I'm trying to think. Uh, got quite a, a group few. called Corpse. They've Corpse. got some pretty gangster stuff. Uh, from, a, yeah, from a disco perspective, Babbitt. I don't know if you guys know him. Really cool, funky house music. Um, so I guess I've got to ask, well, yeah. there's a little bit of a lull. Sorry to jump. I know you guys want to ask questions, but to, I, I mean, look, I know you guys have an eclectic music taste. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of being musicians. You appreciate everything, but. So like, you're at home now, I mean, you're just chilling out. Is it gonna be electronic music or are you just gonna let it play? You Depends on the time of day, man. So yeah. like in the morning, um, when it's like, I like to listen to the birds actually, just like listen to nature. And it's then like, Yeah. You, you <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just like listening to like nothing besides that and then like once the sound goes up, whatever it is, and obviously having a family it also helps, you know, like uh, more chilled music in the house versus like intense stuff. Yeah. But um, I mean, I, I was just look, looking now, like Wilkinson, like drum and bass, Rocksteady, Gabe, like full techno, um, that kind of vibe. So, I, be eclectic. whatever, whatever yeah. is, is well produced to me, I suppose, in the sense of like, you can just feel it's good. I like to listen to it. Um, sorry I couldn't have said more artists, man, but. Uh, yeah, it's uh, quite uh, a few artists. You're pretty good, dude. <laughs> cool. Um, cool. Oh, friend. Um, with your label, where do you draw the limit? Uh, with like the genre. Hard style. Uh, no, what are you talking about? It's the best. <laughs> Hard style's the best. It depends, really. I mean, like, again, like, if, the, if, if we are enjoying it, we'll release it. Like, there's no, like, probably like clown core. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I mean, Underground I, I can't see the value in that, core. really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. No, I mean, I, dude, I, I used to grow up in hard, hard style. I used to go to Gallery 96 Degrees. I know those places very well. So, um, yeah, lovely. <laughs> Love to hear it. Cool. You just made, you, you just made Brandon's day. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a ah, flash drive. Cool. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. where that's hitting. Yeah, I've got a question that sort of follows on that one. Cool. Independent, independent artist approaches you for a release on your label. Are yeah. you looking for them to have a brand behind them? Or no. No. Nah. Quality of music. Quality of music, bro. Like, I'm not really worried about people on social media. Like, seriously. And it's about, you know, like, what you're bringing, 
you know, like because also you don't know where they are in their journey. You know what I mean? Like people, no one has a brand when they start, so you need to have the foresight to see like good music will be good music, mm. and if you don't have a brand, that's your issue, not mine. Because like let's. Yeah. That, uh, sort of, the point become so big and difficult to of course. So you just sort of always focus on the music. Yeah. Um, so yeah that's I think it's the, the most important thing is focusing on the music. And like, I mean, so we've only started out recently. So we've only, <clears throat> what, there's two people we've released, I think, on the album. And yeah. the one guy is like super young and up and coming and stuff. And it's been cool to chat to him and just give him some, some insights and stuff. He's had a lot of questions, you know, what was it like with UMG? What, 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 what? And it's cool to be able to just pass on a bit of knowledge and a bit mm. of, like, look, we wish people had told us this in our point, you know, at this point in the career. Um, so, yeah, man, for us, it's very much so not about the brand. And we're not aiming for the, yeah. you know, we just want to build. And good music is good music. And if we can be a part of that, that's awesome. And, yeah. you know. And also touching back, because, I mean, back in the day when we were releasing music, we actually had parties to go to. There's four call now. So, yeah. like, you know, we have to, like, <laughs> it's like, not even a joke. It's like, mm-hmm. so what's the point? But, again release music because now that's going to be the only way for people to really get around who you are and Mm -hmm. yeah also just on that point just another thing um so Ivan that was here yesterday about I mean I'll never forget it It was about five years ago we did there was a another kind of session thing happening and the most the most salient point that I can take away from from that and I still it's in my mind today is the music you're releasing like as an up-and-coming artist is 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 not that it's sonically going to be different to like an established duo or group like Pascal and Pierce or an established artist, but what, what he said was do not focus on trying to always monetize everything. I mean, yes, you want to have it released. Yes, you want it to be there, but your music is your business card. Like you can have the Facebook, you can have the Instagram, you can have TikTok, you can look as cool as you want, you can have 10 million followers, doesn't matter. Bottom line is everyone's always going to judge you. You're as good as your last show. You're as good as your last mix. You're as good as your last release. But the most important thing is that business card. Like your band camp, your SoundCloud, packing it full of stuff, consistently releasing. You know, and I'm not saying like every day or like once a week, but that consistent release and, and taking pride in what you've got and treating each release as a business card. Because mm-hmm. when somebody asks, can I see it? When you send them an EPK, there's a, you know, the press package, your links to all your, your socials, your band camp and everything, and they can go and get it. And that's how they'll discover it. And it will go further forward. And it's two years, three years, four years down the line, all of a sudden, now you're starting to generate X amount a month. And, you know, yeah. but it, then again, you also have to be disciplined in it as well. And that's, that's actually the hard part, to yeah. be completely honest. And, and also touching on like having a balanced life. Oh, because if you are only focused on music, you're not going to come right. You need to have health. You need to have some form of like... Friends, social just, life. Yeah, that, that helps. Um, I mean, look, if, if you're not there for each other, then it's just pointless. So if you, if you do know someone that needs friends or needs some, yeah. some sort of communication, get on that phone yeah. after Seriously. this. Yeah. But on that sense, it's just having a, a balanced life gives you better music yes. in the sense of like your drive, your capability, what you can do every day. You know, if you're just focusing on one thing, man, so many things slip you by and you just neglect. I mean, um, let's, talk, let's be honest, uh, mental health, like you said, is a huge issue, but also just physical health in the sense of actually exercising. Yeah. I mean, running, get, get out and run, it, uh, get out and breathe, go look at the sun, sit on a mountaintop. It, it, it does incredible things for your creative. I'm oh, sorry. Go look at the sun, he says. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. Dude. Wear sunglasses. Um, <laughs> but I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Anyone else? Sure. Uh, what door do you use? Oh. What, what the front door? Cubase. Cubase since we started. G-A-W, I love that. Q-Base. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, there was a We were making oh, jokes yeah, now we, when we arrived. We did FL and... We did FL for a while. FL3, when I, like when I started, started, started. And was EasyJ. Remember oh, well, EasyJ? Cool. Yeah. EasyJ. Jeez, dude. That was the original, bro. The DVD, you got to yeah. like the DVD yeah, and the stuff. DVD. <laughs> Please don't give my computer what, viruses. No, DVDs are discs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's been Cubase pretty much. And we sampled like Ableton for a bit when we were trying to do a live thing. Mm. But I don't know, like we were saying, Steve, you can do anything in any DAW these days. Like they all, you can make music in anything. It's what you're comfortable and what you work mm. fast in. And Cubase has always just worked for us. So we did Cubase. And sonically, I mean, let's be honest, we are, we're, we're, we're an avid learning center and an Ableton learning center. I mean, it's a, mm. it's a thing. But 
Uh, that is industry standard for mixing and mm. post-production. Of course. But you know what? Uh, whether it's Reaper, whether it's Project One, whether it's, it doesn't actually matter. You can record, I'm GarageBand. I have literally heard guys produce some of the sickest stuff I've ever heard and it's in GarageBand using everything that's there. So I think, you know, we, the, the, big, the big takeaway I think is always stop worrying about what program trying to be cool. Not that I think, you know, but uh, just, just do it, like straight up, just do it. And, and if you can't afford something, that's cool too, you know. Uh, wait, I have to be very careful how I put that. Um, when you start making money from music, at that point, everything you're using needs to be owned. End of story. That's as deep into that as I'm going to go, but yeah. that's the right thing to do. Well, if yeah. and, and also put back into the music that you make. So yes. I remember like one of our first gigs or paychecks we got, we just bought a PC. Yeah. And it was just like, it was like reinvesting in the business, you know, it's so important to do that. Because so everyone starts off like that, There's, the, the stuff's too expensive, you can't yeah, can dive straight it's in. Truth, yeah. It's the truth, everyone yeah. starts off like that, yeah. like back in the day it was, you knew a mate who had a hard drive filled with goodness and you would rape that hard drive and that was that. And then, you know, but as soon as we started making money off it, exactly as you yeah. say, first thing we did was, you know, started purchasing, legit, we were lucky to have legit Cubase from the start. But it was just very important for us to purchase legit things. And we find now, as you're saying, do we have a toolbox or do we like to experiment? Yeah. We've got a little toolbox. because It's all the things that we've purchased that, you know, yeah. it's all legit at all. And funny enough, like we've had a couple of issues where shit's crashed or there have been issues or there have been handfuls like that. And that happened to us back in the day and it was a disaster. It's like you fucked your on your own, man. Like, good luck. Yeah. Whereas I'm trying to think, what was it that crashed? Something crashed was next or something. And it was like, no, sent them an email. Like, this isn't working. And they got on it. The guy took over the remote control. Yeah. And it was one of the weirdest experiences of my life. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning. I was having a meltdown because my shit wasn't working. <laughs> sent these guys support. The guy was like, sure, can I take control of your desktop? I was like, sorry, what now? <laughs> this was like a few years ago. Team viewer, yes. Wait, it was before all of that, Dude, man. Shit. I'd no, never seen yeah. this before, man. And then the mouse started moving around. <laughs> And I was like, I'm too high. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> but like, yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, and yeah. it's just that experience right there. Yeah. It's worth yeah. every cent you've ever no, paid. It, it it's the back end It support. makes a huge difference. And, and, really and I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll never forget, like, but when, I was, when I was teaching here years ago, um, you know, step students, actually from you in your class, guys used to come in, and there was always like, yeah, man, I don't understand it. I've got viruses everywhere. I've lost page <laughs> files. My, Mac, my Windows machine is done. I'm like, just bring it in. We'll reinstall it. And, uh, you know, you bring it in. And this guy has got literally a folder, which at the time was, okay, so you would maybe like a 256K uh, meg drive, uh, a gig drive was kind of like a big drive yeah. or 250 gig drive. Yeah. And then <laughs> this guy would have like 150 gigs of oxygen or ozone and <laughs> the, the plugging cracks. And you just look at the oak and you're just like, yeah, no. Computer says no, bro. Um, and it does. It makes everything more stable. Yeah. Um, it's completely it streamlined. And also, the interesting thing is that uh, because there's not certain issues running in the background, processes running in the background, it frees up your CPU. So the programs run completely smoothly as, as well, which gives you a lot less of an issue. Totally. We, we also like to do an annual cleanup. Mm. So the re-backup, reinstall, and it's, it's just a pleasure oh, so doing it legit. <laughs> let's talk about backups quickly before. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I know you guys yeah. are not sorry, Russell. That's a but huge one. Like, um, Please, impart knowledge. So backups, it's like the most important thing ever. Like mm. it got us bad once in the early days and we vowed to never let it get it again. Mm. And it was a very humbling experience to go through that and to lose all of that stuff and just feel so helpless. Yes. Mm. And just, it was just the worst. I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. And since then we've been very diligent with our backups. And there have been a couple of times where we've been very thankful for our diligence. Yeah, because it's calm, whatever the case may be. Yeah. yeah, just whatever it is, just just back up your stuff, just back it up, and then we've tried to back it up on at least two different sources. Mm -hmm. I used to lock one in my safe, and then Pusky would hang on to one just in case there's a fire. Yeah, <laughs> but like so it's proper. Yeah, I mean we do have so much respect because obviously you put so much time and effort into the studio, man. Like. And I'm still a little bit anti-cloud. Not anti-cloud, it's just new age. And I'm not quite there <laughs> no, yet. No, no, I'm, I'm there. I've got, I've got one drive. I'm happy with it. But I've yeah, got 15 cool. hard drives, bro. There we go. There we go. There we go. Yeah, no, 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 no. Old school. <laughs> one drive's fun, but hard drives are important. Hard drives are a thing, yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. yeah, yeah. Sorry, Russell. <laughs> cool. Uh, 
it up. Ooh. And then the last one is who does your, your mastering? Cool. So we've got a pair of ears at the moment uh, for our like reference monitor studio speakers. And then... Um, but we've also got a pair of creative like rubbishes. Just to give you that. And it's so important the new day version to... Minus 10. Very important. And yeah, then, yeah. And then your um, car. And then we're just pretty much sitting in there giving like a good balanced perspective on where things are. Car test is very important. Yeah. I mean, headphones can be a bit... It can throw you off a bit, depending on what brand you're using, and you know, you'll sometimes find there's just a better response. Yeah, yeah, mm. of course. So, um, and obviously, getting more of your friends to listen to your music, like, because that's something they can just pick up naturally. Um, if they can bug you to your music first time, that's a good mm. thing. Man. Um, plugins, man, we've got quite a few actually, like the ones we go to. I think what we're using these days is ozone for most things in terms of EQs, compressions, maximizers, spatial. Um, nectar for the vocals is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ozo, we could pretty much get by just with that, man, to be honest with yeah. you. In terms of just the, like the trying to think what else. maybe? I mean, hey? VSTs. Um, we've got quite a few that we like to. Obviously, like getting back to before the lecture started, uh, it's, about, it's about knowing one VST yeah. well. Uh, I'm quite a big fan of the, the Steinberg, like standard one. Yeah. So, like, yeah. um, what's the, is it the dub delay? What yeah. do we use? The stereo delay? Man, we'll just use the same things over and over again and just tweak them slightly differently. Um, but as we were saying earlier, I think that's definitely one thing that's it's minimized immensely over the years. Because back in the day, we would just have <laughs> legitimate software. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no judge, just like right? this, man. <laughs> and now it's, do you know what I mean? We just need one EQ. We just need yeah. one compressor, really. I mean, you can get, yeah, it has its merits. Yeah, but I have, think yeah. for our style of production and what we've found, we know what works for us. Yeah. So, you know, I'm super happy. What's the standard Cubase reverb? Is it the R verb or whatever, so whatever it is. But again, Cubase reverb, love the Cubase reverb. But it, dep <laughs> it, it all it. depends though, because obviously you get, you get different texture from different plugins and different uh, yeah. scopes. So um, we do like to uh, treat ourselves with new, with new toys from time mm. to time. So I think from there, there's always that capability to pick up something but it's it's interesting you do like Dave says you go back to what you know mm. um, and sometimes there's that like new edge that comes out um, I remember when I think it was Ace there's a plugin called Ace, Ace came in yeah. came out it was like like the plugin UHE. of the month or whatever UHE Ace. yeah so we, we got that thing like ten dollars whatever it was and ended up using it like massive like five times yeah. so it's just you know you don't end up using something that is really popular at the time but it's you, know, you just go with the flow. Um, yeah. And then getting back to your mastering question, yeah. which is a guy called Mike Kelly. I don't know if you know about him. Uh, very, very famous, well, to us at least. <laughs> and a good friend, uh, he's staying in Germany at the moment. Uh, he's got a really good set of ears in the sense of uh, what we want and I trust what he does. He's remixed a lot of work for us. Mm. Um, incredible chap and yeah, good producer. So, so. Exceptional Mike producer. Kelly, as in yeah, Mike Kelly. Seriously? Mike Kelly, yeah. yeah. Man. He's mastering now. Did you yeah. see his, his mastering? Uh, mm. He went through a whole uh, lecture, like one of the best engineers in Germany yeah. was teaching Mike's him. Mike's a legend. Man. Proper. Mike's on a different he's level. A, he's a, I, I'm not just saying he's, he's a top dude. I, 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 I see Mike in Murgatroyd as like... <laughs> 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 Mike? Yeah, they like... No, 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 seriously. They're on a different level in terms of the understanding of... That's, I, wow. Yeah. I still thought Mike was hanging out in Cape Town. But no, all right, never mind. Yeah. He's on the techno train. He's moved oh, to Berlin. Well, I would expect nothing less. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. And he signed to a really cool um, label now, too. So, oh, okay. yeah. Mm. Sorry, just mental note. Just packing something in the back for a live stream chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, it, it depends. I mean, so we've still got the. So, yeah. when I turned 18, I got um, from my parents a computer with one of those like thick monitors and stuff. I'm old now. It sucks. <laughs> um, and it was Cubase 3 SX, I think, and, and it focus. came with a Steinberg, like, I think it's an MI2. An MI2. And focus right. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's a Steinberg MI2, so yeah, it yeah. came with that. And the other one, yeah. And then, so we had a focus right for a bit, and then Pusky was using that with his MacBook. So I've always had the MI2 in the studio PC. It is now nearly 20 years old. And it's funny because recently now when Microsoft dropped Windows 7, oh, yeah, I remember everyone that. had to upgrade to Windows 10. And I was like, but I like my Windows 7. <laughs> like, don't make me do it. And I waited until like January the 6th or whatever because they said it on yeah, January the 7th, the day, like yeah. this cut. So then I did Windows 10. And the fuck up was 
it doesn't really work with Windows 10 so good. Yeah. So it works enough to survive. It works with Cubase. It works, thank God. So that's all we need really. Um, it but you have to plug in other Record yeah. box. So that's cool for the DJ stuff. And there's like one other thing it works with, but otherwise it does not work at all with Windows 10. Yeah. Um, so that's been my cuck and we're gonna have to upgrade at some stage, but it's like family, man. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's treated us so good. It's, it's so every good. song we've ever made has come through that little bastard. And it's, yeah, so, that the, the, the work ethic again, it's like, it works, right? Um, so there are broke, so many cool ones it. available. I mean, yeah, no, it's just crazy. It's endless yeah, nowadays, yeah. actually. And yeah. what you can have, um, but again, working with Mike, yeah. The treatment is, is getting your pre-master to the point where you're comfortable enough with the EQing, mm. you're comfortable enough with how it's sounding, and having a good reference also. Because if you can build yourself a good reference to say, mm. this is where we're going. I mean, so, someone taught us that once in our earlier days. Always reference, always reference, always reference. And it's, yeah, it's, it's helped out a lot. The gospel. I think that was, that was pretty much hammered into you by at least four of us at this place. Yeah. One of them yeah. is Richard. We know that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think, maybe I didn't take that to heart so much then, but someone at some point told me and I was like, AK, okay. <laughs> that's an absolute game changer. No, yeah, yeah. sorry. So, um, workflow. Yeah. Workflow, workflow. What, sorry? Um, workflow. 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 Oh, yeah. So, again, um, Virtual Ride, comparative to, I'm assuming, a different style of your other friend. I can just imagine that the two being way different because obviously Virtual Ride being more high energy style, you can just lay it down a lot easier in that sense, maybe. Um, but I think getting back to workflow and how we do create things, it's generally speaking melody, I would say. Yeah, you know, it's probably closer to the second one you yeah. said there. When you so like what I'm, like I was saying, I like to start with a Nexus sawtooth default thing. Yeah. And then depending on the idea that you've got in your head, like it can layer out like a full symphony in one, you know, piano roll. And then from there, then dissect it and be like, okay, cool, here's your bass line, here's your lead, here's a little harmony, here's a little da da da. So then you'll take that bit out and stick that on a different sound or whatever yeah. might be working or. But again, on the style though, because I find that like we can make like a house record and getting the drums right in the beginning to sit nice with, with a simple bass, mm. that to me will define your structure mm. and your mm. like your integrity of the sound. To um, agree. <laughs> uh, but if, if you look at um, you know virtual riot stuff, that's going to be a lot of sense, a lot of melody in the beginning, and that's going to be your emphasis, I reckon, because we we do chop and change our drum arrangement quite a bit, because obviously you want a double drum or whatever it is or double kick uh, in a certain place. Um, so I think synth selection would probably become like last or mm. towards last. I'd say arrange, um, arrangement also is quite far down because yeah. we've made so many songs now together. Like that was always a big issue in the beginning, like arrangement, yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? Like you've got this idea, you've got this drop, like now what? And I think when we started making like, it was like electro, electro was the thing there and songs were like eight minutes long and it was like this fucking journey and it was just like, what the fuck? And I think it was a lot of confusion over arrangement and how to make this idea into a song. And I think for us, that's become a lot easier with time. Like, it's almost something that we can kind of put on coolers and get everything down, get everything sounding right. And then at the end, it's just like, okay, that, 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 arrangement done. Because we yeah. know also the amount of time we spend DJing together, like uh, we'll, we'll create a song to how we would want to play it on the dance floor. So we know that like, like I'm kind of partial to a 30 second intro. I know Pusky like more of a minute intro. So we balance that between yeah. who's working on what, you know what I mean? Like if I'm and working on a song, I'll generally always give it a 30 second mixable intro and then from there you know arrangement wise it's going to go into some sort of breakdown and it's going to be some sort of build up and then also you have freedom to, to kind of mess around with that on the fly you know what I mean like mm -hmm. I've, one thing I've always thought with music that's really cool is someone told me back in the day also is like you have to know the rules first before you can break them mm -hmm. so it's cool to learn the rules and what is proper and what is not but if you can break a rule intentionally and that's gangster what are your favorite rules to break 
favorite rules to break? Yeah. All of them. I love durrying where there's no smoking signs, but that doesn't, <laughs> but that doesn't count with this. You favorite really rules to break? Inversions. I probably. love sh sharp sevenths in minor sharp. scales. That's my favorite one. Um, <laughs> Phrygian, all that sort of. Um, yeah, the, the, the flat two flat in the Phrygian. Two. Like that very much too. Um, uh, rules to break, rules to break, rules to break. Also creating sound that's like fun, man. So to you, you know, not necessarily keeping in the box that's trying being specific, like let's write a Fisher record today, you know, like let's do something that's set standard, you know, make something that is out there and adventurous. You look at how like the, especially virtual riot sound, like that, that sound wasn't there like 10, 15 years ago. And now it's like, it's, you know, right there. And, and if you look at, Who's that really big act that's got all those dinosaurs and really cool visual? Excision. Excision, dude. So like, if you look at like Fucking how robots his, and ecstasy and shit. Yeah, it's 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 that situation where you would you wouldn't think that genre or style would be acceptable on a bigger stage because of the toughness and like the it's like quite brutal in, in the in the. It's so great. That's what makes it. The but that's exactly. Excision is the best, bro. But that's what I'm I'm trying to get at. You know, like yeah. make stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think of. You listen to. Have you ever just done that? Like, just like sat down and, I mean, like, I know you, you obviously make stuff there, but I mean, have you ever just sat down and been like, you know, actually, I don't even know anything about this genre and, and actually, let's try it. And then just. But we, we, we do that with all, like, I got our hands on a cool banjo contact patch the other day. Mm. Like, trying to do some, like, country hick banjo stuff. Bruh, my parents would be so stoked on me. <laughs> like, it's like, something sound like children of the corn. Dude. No, no, no. Obviously not with dance. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, it, it was, it was not dancey at all. It was just an idea. It was just a folky. But it was like some Ooh. proper folk hick shit. But and I suppose you guys are doing a cool. lot of stuff for sound design. For you know, you, you guys are doing a lot of pitching for adverts and stuff. So, so that's that's that's, that's that where the banjo anyway. patch came yeah, through. It was from that. Patch. But then after that, it was just like, hey, oh, I got a banjo. Man. Patch. This is a banjo, <laughs> man. Like that's cool. Got an eye joe and all that. I mean, be fine, dude. Yeah, I mean, that sounds horrifying, but, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yes. Awesome. Sorry. Cool. Um, so, if you, one of us wanted to approach your label, yeah. uh, how would we uh, come into contact with you guys? In, info at pascalampios.com. Yeah, great. No worries, man. I apologize profusely in advance for the amount of demos that are going to be oh, it's fine. away by this afternoon. We don't check that very often, so it's fine. Fantastic. Cool. No, I'm just joking. We <laughs> check it daily. <laughs> we check it all the time, all the time, all the time. Everyone's like, hey, wait. <laughs> What's up, guys? What's um, up, dude? You sort of touched on it a little bit, but I just wanted to ask more on the, how have you, it, it was cliche to say it's more about the journey than the destination. Yes. From making it from nowhere to being these big producers or, or, or around um, how did you ensure that you enjoyed the journey more? Because a person speaking from someone who wants to get, you know, to where his dreams and goals are. Mm. How do you, because that's all you focus on, you want to get there and you won't stop until you get there. But For sure. Then you lose track of the journey and you don't care what's going on, you're building up. So how do you, you know, take Stay a in the moment. and enjoy it? Man? Yeah, look, it's difficult, man. Like, I mean, when COVID hit, I was all of a sudden super grateful for all the memories I had from all the big shows. I was like, wow, we've got to do that. Since you've been gone. Exactly. <laughs> and it's, it's been like epic, bro, like to, to kind of realize how if you're not present in the moment, you're not going to enjoy it. It's like it's your wedding day, essentially, every, t every time you get to play, where if you're not taking account to what's actually happening to every finer detail, you're just going to let it fly by. Um, unfortunately, when you get to like big um, festival like setups, because it's so overwhelming, and because you want to get the show so right, your show goes so quick, mm. you don't, and you mm. don't actually embrace what's going on there because you want everything to be so perfect. Um, we do try, though. You do try, of course. You, you, people think and they can feel you living in the moment, but it's like it's different when you're jamming, right? Mm. And you're watching your, your favorite act. You can like be like, wow, this is really cool. But because you're focusing on deliverance and making sure that there's something important and like great, um, it's difficult to be like in the moment, if you know what I mean. Um, it's always cool to, to have a partner on the road too. So because I, I was I was gonna say that man, like it doesn't apply to everyone, but I think having a partner is it, it's the biggest blessing. So we can share everything together, the good times, bad times. Yeah, it's it's easier that way too. You know what I mean? Like 
on the road, it's super, super uh, challenging, especially when you, mm. you know, talked about it earlier, getting up really early for a flight. If you only got back from the show back in the day, especially when there wasn't a curfew, get back from a, like a really cool show at three, four in the morning, and your flight's at five mm. or six, whatever the case may be. You know, and if you buy yourself, the jeez, bro, you better get to that airport, yeah. man. But like, if you're with someone, I can always be like, you know, like, well, there's a knock on the door, or there's someone phoning you. Uh, making sure that you get there. I mean, if you're touch wood, you know, we, we haven't missed any show. Like we've got on to like, we've got done like over We've missed one flight, I think. One flight. In 14 years, we've missed one flight. It's a miracle. It and like, insane. it's one of those things where we've got to that situation um, where we really have a lot of respect for what we do mm. and um, we'll make that show happen, uh, especially if we can book for it, you know. Um, it's just one of those things where it's super, super important to us to fulfill what we've been you know, obligated to do. Yeah. There's, also that, there's also that flip side because you can live in the moment. But the other unfortunate thing sometimes with like being booked for an ultra is that because you're, a, when we were, well, when we were having parties, mm. um, you could be booked for ultra, but at the same time you could have been booked also to go and play in Stellenbosch afterwards or beforehand just somewhere else, then mm. you've got the show, then mm. you're going to another gig. So that, that living in the moment thing becomes actually quite difficult because at the first gig you may be not quite present because you're more concerned or focused about the bigger gig happening later. It's not ideal, but it does happen. Um, and then the other thing is that when you're at the big gig, obviously there's the pressure, like you said, and it's huge and there's tons of people and lights and the sound system's overwhelming. Yeah. But when you've got another thing afterwards where you can't quite hang out, you don't get to, to ease into it. And then yeah. you, 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 you miss that, that wonderful experience because you're so worried about you know, making the 100%. same appearance and being you at each place. And yeah. It's hectic. Yeah, log logistics is such an important thing. Like you've got your time management right and you're smiling most of the time. I know it sounds like it's a difficult thing for some, but if you literally are emitting something good on yourself, you're going to have a good memory of that, that, that sort of perspective and you want to touch back to those moments like sure there would be many times where you're just like why am I here I'm DJing in the middle of nowhere in South Africa and you have to think to yourself I'm here for something so just enjoy it and you know let everyone else enjoy it too so it's, it's difficult man it is really difficult to be to be present uh, on the journey uh, awesome yeah. is there anyone else with a question before I okay cool yeah. there we go I just wanted to ask if you guys ever considered relocating to like the States or Europe somewhere? So yeah, look, if you look at where, what South Africa brings, unfortunately like Botswana and Namibia and Mozambique aren't like Belgium and Germany and in a bigger party destination. So we kind of find isolation in South Africa, ironically now too, um, where um, people don't come to South Africa to party. They come here for our tourism and our great beautiful things we have to offer as a country. So when you look at the bigger picture from a, an essence of where things are at, it would be a lot wiser for a musician to be in a more you know, dominant city where like let's just say you're in Europe, you've got all these close knit cities that you can go tour in over the weekend and still be back home. Versus, it's like Cape Town, Joburg. Yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. So I think um, sending yourself overseas is definitely a lot more beneficial, especially if you want to have a bigger audience a more consistent audience um, and look at what you want to establish yourself as. So you look at like the Asian market right now, they're still very big into EDM and like that kind of, well, I suppose EDM is it's not really a genre, but it's that sort of electronic uh, rave sort of sound. You look at what Europe's going into now. Um, there's a business report uh, brought to you by the IMS, which is the International Music Summit. You can check it out online and every year they give you a good in-depth scope on the business side of the industry and what they do is they showcase which is your top selling uh, genre which is your most successful um, sort of playlisted uh, accounts and which territories are doing really uh, good things um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see where uh, international tour has definitely got you uh, that capability to doing great things but it's just yeah, hard from South Africa it's though. so difficult man like I give it up to guys like Black Coffee and Goldfish. You know, Goldfish took the risk to go move to the States and they're doing really well now. Um, you know. Carl Watson's just moved to the UK. Totally, yeah. Because um, like our, our last international show was in Vietnam yeah. just before COVID. Dude, getting there, man, it was so hectic. We spent, I think, longer traveling than we did in Vietnam. Yeah. We ended up spending like two and a half days there. 
and so just, oh, yeah. fuck, it was such a nightmare. But great experience. Yeah. But just like now, if you're living in, I mean, even then, Vietnam is still far from everything, I guess. But like, if you're living in Europe, that's not that much of a schlep, you know what I mean? It's a lot easier and just manageable to do that on a more regular basis. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah. I think the reality really is, I mean, if you look at Nazi at the moment, or Black Coffee, I mean, now it's a situation where he's in a position where he can, I mean, he's based in Joburg, it kind of was easy to kind of get to place, but he's so, he's so based overseas now. Uh -huh. yeah. it, it, well, I wouldn't be surprised if inevitably that next logical step would be a move to Europe in some way, shape mm. or form, because he's, he's playing there more than he's pl pretty much playing, mm. playing here now. Of course, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I suppose at the end of the day, it's also, you know, do you want to live that lifestyle in a, in a way? Because it's a completely different environment you're used to, you know, the weather's different. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I suppose you also got to look after yourself as well, your family, the, the support system. Sometimes traveling is maybe not that bad. Look, the most important thing is um, making sure that you're making good decisions. Yeah. So, you know, if, the, if, the, if you know that you're going to be making good money for your family, then yeah, so be it. But don't, don't do it all the time because then mm -hmm. you're going to miss your family. So it's that situational thing where you can compromise certain, certain actions. Um, yeah, look, it must be an incredible journey what he's on right now. Sure. Like, I can only imagine the jet lag, um, but well worth it from what yeah, it seems. Any nomination, totally. all of this is mm. going to yeah. blow up, I think. So. And it's, it's, it's cool to see because South Africa really needs that sort of limelight. Mm. You know, uh, we need that sort of understanding that we can produce great talent. Mm. And it's and just, it's just bubbling talent. away now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, We've got some really cool international artists out there okay. that are from SA. Cool. Guys, I think uh, all that's really... Oh, cool. <laughs> no, that's just Dan. No, okay. just I think Dan's just here to tell me that, 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 that food's probably... You're a legend. Right. Cool. <laughs> for once, we actually got it right today. We have the food ready for you to go and eat. So, uh, without further ado, um, guys, thank you so very much. Thank you very much, man. Um, Thanks, guys. It's... Amazing. Yeah, amazing. Please come join us if you've got a couple of minutes. I'm sure there'll be tons more questions. People are a bit nervous sometimes, but it's cool. But we've got some pizzas in the library and some Cokes and stuff. Um, guys, also, please join us. And then, uh, yeah, Antonio, we'll look forward to your session at about, what did I say, half past one? No, quarter, well, one o'clock, great. Let's make a quarter past one. We're good, there you go. Quarter past one, guys. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, cool. everyone.